Welcome yeah. to Trine Days of the Journey, conversations with publisher Chris Milligan. I am Bruce DeTorres. With us are Sherry Seymour, a former investigative journalist and licensed private detective who wrote The Last Circle, Danny Casalaro's investigation into the octopus and the Promise Software scandal about Casalaro's mysterious death and the shadowy organization he called the octopus, which reached into the mafia, the Cali drug cartel, and the U.S. Department of Justice. Also with us are filmmakers Zachary Trist and Christian Hansen, whose four-part documentary, The Octopus Murders, launched on Netflix on February 28th, showing many tales of intrigue and murder concerning Danny Casalaro's investigation into the octopus. And now, Chris Milligan. Bruce, thank you very much. And Christian and Zach and Sherry, thank you so much for coming on. You know, um, I, I want to applaud you, Christian and Zach, for, you know, doing the work and getting uh getting it published okay getting it aired because uh uh i've i've been looking at some of this stuff for too dang long you know and uh it was very very nice to see and i, I just want to mention a little bit thing here you know i was watching the the show and and christian you mentioned that well, you, you started looking at this at 25 and now you're 35 and all kinds of stuff like that. Well, imagine, you know, I was a, uh, what was the day before my 19th birthday? Okay. And this was 1968, I guess. And heavy, I, that's I, a heavy year. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I, I come to the house. Uh, I, I'm, you know, we're going to have ice cream and cake. And my dad uh, tells me, he says, well, it's time to have a talk. And, and he had alluded to it earlier. He'd asked me what I thought about the Vietnam War. And I gave him a flip teenage answer several years before. I says, well, you know, you've got a sack of hand grenades and you got some rice patties and you go throw the hand grenades for the good guys wearing the white hats. I'd been raised on World War II and John Wayne and everything. And so uh, it's just a flip answer. So uh my dad says it's time to have this talk so he took me into my little what i called my little brother's room and sat down in a chair and he had a he had a friend there visiting him that day it was a professor from vanderbilt dr df fleming and and uh he sat on my little brother's bed and i was sitting on a chair and my dad was sitting on a chair my dad looks at me and he says the vietnam war is about drugs there's these secret societies behind it okay and I figure he's talking about the mafia, you know, and then, and then he says, and communism's all a sham. These same secret societies are behind it all. It's all a big game. Okay. Uh, I think my dad's nuts. Okay. I've been stuffed under the desk. The Ruskies are going to bomb us. Okay. And then they start telling me all about my dad's intelligence career, which had never been mentioned. I knew my dad had been in the CIA. Well, we suspected it. it had been talked between my older brother and my older sister, but my mom and dad had, it had never, never been mentioned at all. Okay. Your and, dad was a clandestine officer. He had a, a, a cover job. Well, first he was overt. Okay. He was branch chief head of all of East Asia analysis office. Okay. So, okay. And it, it seems like he would know something about the Vietnam War. Right, right. And then he went covert because they needed somebody to talk to Sicarno. Okay. And they needed somebody that was a little bit more liberal. And my dad had been raised in the West Coast and wasn't your typical uh, CIA guy. And so they sent him along with me and the rest of my family. I was a little kid uh, to Indonesia. So my daddy could talk to Sicarno. So, uh, you know, I mean, it... It took me 20 years, okay, to to figure out what my daddy was, was telling me, you know. And here, you know, so I can relate to this journey, okay, that you went on. You're, you're 24 and, and you, you look at this stuff and you say, gosh, what is this? And then you dive in, <laughs> okay, uh, go down many different rabbit holes. and They don't, you know, they don't make it easy to find out 
what's going on. It's, no, it seems no. It, me and Zach have discussed it a lot. It seems that it's like almost intentionally confusing. Well, the, you've got, you know, uh, we were looking at in, you know, I, I started uh, looking into the subject I called CIA drugs. And, you know, I mean, that's what he was talking about, you know, and it was very interesting because in the uh, little research community of CIA drugs, we had a bunch of people that were sent in there to, you know, well, you guys want to look over here, you know, and 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 we come to find out that some of it had been through what I, there's two sides of CIA drugs. There's CIA drugs or narcotics importation, then there's CIA drugs, uh, the dark side, the MK Ultra, and they'd been you know, involved with some of that. So it was very, very uh, interesting. And, and, and then through my research in CIA drugs, um, I met uh, Sherry Seymour, okay, uh, which I, I was, you know, first I, I came across her book online, you know, I mean, Sherry wrote a book, and instead of just, you know, getting it published, she put it online for everybody to read. And yeah, that's a part, it, Sherry, did you intentionally leak your manuscript online, or did you give it to someone and it got online? It was through a university if I'm not mistaken. Right. This was, um, I gave it to someone, uh, 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 John McCain and uh, James Warner wanted it. And um, so I sent it to them because they were going to open a congressional hearing on the manuscript, the first 15 chapters. And uh, it ended up at Cornell University and the employee, the, the computer technologist there at Cornell University put it on the internet and this in is such like a early way internet that nobody days. yeah this was like in 1995 yeah 96. 95 okay and that uh in such a way that nobody could ever get it down and then they told me about it that they had done that and um anyway so then he wanted a cover sheet for it it was already up there he wanted a cover sheet explaining it so i sent a cover i sent him a cover sheet which said that i was doing the research on it and any investigator that uh, could come up with more information on this you know to add to it i was setting it out there it wasn't my intention to put it out there but they it was already up and by then it was too late to get it back down you or now you you published that book or you you that manuscript you were, were writing under a pen name carol yeah Marshall. my sister Carol Marshall, that was my sister's name, my deceased sister's name. And um, so I used that name. And uh, for many years, uh, it was the first. This was just one that you could had access to the Internet. That was the first about Danny Castellaro on the Internet. Yeah. On the Internet itself. The other uh, uh, articles that had been written by Ron Rosenbaum and Vanity Fair and so on, um, <clears throat> they were periodicals they were in the scrapbooks in, yeah. right and the first internet version was was the manuscript and it created quite a firestorm and this went on for quite a long time and then ultimately i was contacted by um high times i was doing articles for them i did a huge huge article on danny castellaro called the ghost of danny castellaro for high high times magazine and um what year was then, that that would have been approximately oh gosh um in the 2000s or 2001 late, okay. 2000, august okay. 2001 issue wow. and then it was a huge um mini page article and then um um trans high corporation wanted to publish it and they sent me a contract and a friend of mine at universal studios a lawyer read it and said this is a really bad contract so um then chris contacted me <clears throat> and as i talked to him for 30 minutes and from that moment on, I have been a devoted fan of Chris. I went with him. I went with the contract he sent me. Everything was fair. Um, that was 13 years ago. He is still um, my hero. And I call him Lionheart. He's an yep. incredible uh, person as well as publisher. Well, Stormbird well, Sherry, and Lionheart. Yeah. You got it. Yeah. Well, Sherry, I mean, uh, your work was an in incredible uh, find because, you know, CIA drugs, you know, it was quite obvious that something was going on, okay, but then trying to get down into the weeds and figure out it, you know, was, was quite the journey, and you were one of the first people to really get down into the weeds 
okay? Because you were trying to figure out how come all these drugs were there around Maricopa, right? Well, not just yeah. the, the the weeds. No, the the real life, really scary, really bizarre con men, criminal spies that other reporters only would talk about or maybe talk to on the phone. You became their best buddy or what no you got you got right in there you met them you went you know that was amazing followed three months after danny cathalaro's demise his death i jumped on the trail and i followed it and i find and this is something i would like to mention i followed all this i had his documents that i got from the university they were still archiving them <laughs> and i i started following his trail and um the story just like what you have in the documentary. The story is the story. In other words, you can go at the story from different angles, but the truth is still the truth. And what's so amazing to me when I saw the documentary is that it follows the exact same trail I followed. You came to all the same conclusions that I did, completely separately from me, completely individually. And we came to the same conclusions and found the same facts. And that to me was amazing to see that on, to see your investigation was completely separate from mine and yet we all came to the same truths that Danny it, did. It's sort of like a peer reviewed journal or something, you know? It was amazing, you know, I'm just, I wanna congratulate both of you. Um, you've done everyone proud and you've done especially Danny, Danny Casalaro proud. Amen. Zach. What was it like following Christian about? I mean, how much did you know about the story, it, you know? Well, first off, you know, Christian and I are friends from a long time ago. So I think that we had a bond that was necessary to do something this complicated, this difficult, and this, long, you know, long period of time. Uh, it It would have been very hard to do with somebody that you're not close friends with um, and that you don't like being around. Um, so, you know, I came to it. I'm my background is more in independent film and, you know, narrative stuff. Not I I'd never done anything close to this before, you know, documentary style uh, or, you know, a long form documentary. And so I was just the friend who Christian would tell about, you know, he's was researching the private prison industry and came to Wackenhut and started telling me about Danny Casalero, who had also started looking into Wackenhut. And at first it was kind of like, oh, that's interesting. You know, I mean, I, I knew Christian as a New York Times photographer. You know, that's that was that was his uh, his job. And then he starts talking about this other stuff. And I was like, well, what about the photography stuff? And, he's, and it's like that sort of it became a lot more. A lot less about f stops and you know photographs or whatever and a lot more about this danny casalero story and so i was just a sounding board for him for a long time and then you know we we did not plan on making a documentary but when he told me that michael reconosciuto was getting out of prison at that point you know i knew just the ba the basics of the story so i knew that michael was an important character in the story for danny and christian and you know i just said you know, we're going to regret it if we ever wanted to make a documentary or even if you want to make your book, like you will just regret not picking him up from prison. And so in 2017, that's where we really started and with no intention of any what it would become. But we just took a took a risk and got on a plane and, and met Michael. And that's that's really where my journey into this formally begins. Uh, so Michael, Rock, I can never say his last name. I was very proud of the people in the film saying his name correctly. Uh, what do you, what do you, what is Sherry and, and, and Christian, what do you guys think of him? He's a very uh, interesting, um, very uh, brilliant, um, brilliant guy. Uh, he, uh, he, I mean, you know, he's a, he's a complicated figure. I, I personally like Michael, like we've spent, a lot of time together um and uh i think he's a fascinating and in, and intriguing um and um you know I, like he i i it's really such a shame that he had to do such a long time for um for doing drugs i, I you know i don't i don't know he's a complicated guy i don't i don't think he's 
a, a bad person. Um, but I don't like, I don't know. It's, it's Sherry, what, what, what's your take on Michael? Well, <clears throat> I spent three months talking to him on the phone. He would call me every day, sometimes two or three times a day from jail. I never met him at, before he had went, was in jail. And he would call me and uh, we would talk and he gave me permission to tape record because what he talks about is very complicated. And so he allowed me to tape record all the conversations and uh, for three months. And then ultimately I went and interviewed his nemesis, Robert Booth Nichols. And Nichols kept telling me during the meeting that Michael was going to kill me. This is in the book. This is a, the chapter 12 is all about my meeting with Robert Booth Nichols. And, uh, and by the way, I'm the only person that ever interviewed Nichols besides Danny. So, um, but I left that meeting and basically I never accepted a call from Rikonoshito after that. Not that it was his fault. It's just that I was getting deeper and deeper into this netherworld. And at some point, Rikonoshito's wife called me and said, get out of the house, run. And this was one week after I had in interviewed Nichols. They're coming to get you, and so on and so forth. And I didn't really know what to do. So uh, a, chief of, a friend of mine who was chief of police in Merced came down with his car, and they put a bulletproof vest on me, put me in the back seat of the car, down on the floor, and drove me out of Mariposa. I ended up in Galveston for three months. Then I came back to work at the newspaper and went back to being the editor at the newspaper. And that was, um, you know, my experience with that. So I never s basically spoke with Michael until Mike Abel was arrested. And um, <clears throat> which is the last, the very last person that Danny Casalara was investigating. And when Abel was arrested, uh, I contacted uh in, in jail to um, get more information from him because he was trying... Through Danny, he was trying to trade Mike Bell for entrance into the witness protection program. And then after Danny died, <clears throat> then Rikonoshito jumped over to me and wanted me to be the, the um, go-between between between him and the FBI and provide the Mike Bell information to the FBI, and uh, which I and did. And you started working on brokering a deal for him or something. You, you put him in a position to to get one you got a uh a, a high level i can't remember what agency but a, a high level uh yeah I government do have... uh investigator to begin having conversations with michael my husband was in in during the vietnam war was in cambodia and in military intelligence and he has contacts but anyways we both have top secret security clearances so people take it seriously when i start talking to the government they basically trust me but anyways no i was uh the fbi agent came to my house and he would talk to michael on the phone and uh, michael was trying to make a trade he wanted to get into witness protection he was going to sell all the, the work that he was doing on promise laundering money uh on the promise software he was going to um, trade micah bell now at that time micah bell was a prestigious lawyer in washington dc former Department of Justice, Director of International Affairs, before he retired. He wrote and, the uh, extradition treaty between, or he was like one of the main um, uh, authors of the extradition treaty between the United States and Colombia. Right. So right. then he became the darling of the Cali cartel, who had formerly been calling themselves Los Extraditables, the one thing they hated more than anything was the thought or the possibility of being extradited to the United States because they could handle Colombia. Oh, and yeah. so then they they befriend, they they bring into their family the 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 guy that wrote the extradition treaty knows all the loopholes and and every time they got in trouble abroad, he was able Michael Bell was able to get them out. They 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 loved him. <laughs> Michael was aware was that's what he was trying to trade because Abel was actually working for Gilberto Rodriguez and Jose Londoño, leaders of the Cali cartel. And ultimately, someone from San Francisco, I have no idea who it was, uh, sent uh, Scott Lawrence 
uh, customs in Boston. And that information got to him. And um, that's a long story, which I don't want to take up the space right now here. It's in the book. You can read all about it in the book. Oh. Anyways, he he went to he followed Micah Bell to Bogota, Colombia, to the doorstep of the Cali cartel. And um, ultimately, a bell was arrested and indicted. He was indicted and then arrested for laundering money for the Cali cartel. Now, this is what Michael tried to trade even when he was first arrested. And this this was long before. And then he tried to go through Danny the last five days of Danny's life when he was in Martinsburg. He was trying to um, obtain information on Micah Bell, even went to the Department of Justice. And what was funny was uh, he, he bounced this off Robert Booth Nichols and he told Bob Bickle he would confide in Bob Bickle that he had was tracking a bell and that he had spoken to Nichols about it. Bob Bickle now, Mike, was just, uh, if I can, I'll just interject. Bob yeah, Bickle yes, was a, uh, an informant for customs. Um, he worked in the offshore oil industry in um, off the coast of Texas, I guess in the Gulf of Mexico. Anyways, I'll say, and he was a source of Danny's. I'll send yeah. it back to you, Sherry. Right. Well, anyways, that uh, personally, I think the fact that Danny was um, investigating Mike Bell that, um, and calling Nichols about it, I think, I, I, I don't know if I should stick my neck out here now, but I think that uh, Nichols became very worried about that and actually flew out to talk to Danny about it and warned Danny, you're in very dangerous waters here. You better sh shut that down. And Danny called Richard Stavin and Thomas Gates, FBI agent Thomas Gates in L.A., and Richard Stavin, former um, head of the drug um, strike force. Drug yeah, strike force. And I told them, I've been told to shut down this investigation. Do you think I'm at risk? And um, this was going on during the 6th of August. Danny was found dead on the 10th. So he was into some, and I personally believe that um, somehow a bell, because Danny was walking around the Department of Justice asking about Mike Bell, that um, a bell learned about it. Nichols knew about it. Uh, ultimately, I think the Kali cartel found out about it. Yeah. And at that point, Danny was in a lot of trouble. It's also it, this is just a just an interesting data point. I'm not. I don't want people to draw any conclusions. But within a few days of Danny's death in Martinsburg, one of the top Colombian hitmen for the cartels was arrested in New York City. Just throwing that out there. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. Drugs is all. All through this uh, conspiracy and corruption, and just to mention again, Sherry's book is called The Last Circle, and your guys' thing on Netflix is called An American Conspiracy, The Octopus Murders. And, you know, we, we I got an email from uh, someone who's been uh, emailing me about the Promise software for a while, and, and she watched your Netflix thing, and one thing she saw was that in the uh, clip on uh, John Nichols, there was a, a degree showing on the wall from Palathy College, province of Ontario. And it, it's a place that does these false degrees. So we get into this milieu where you have, you know, uh, fake bishops, uh, fake sh uh, orders, uh, you know, like the Shikshini Knights. And, you know, you have a bunch of intelligence people involved in this. And so, I mean, you've got a, a wild milieu out there where this is uh, operating in. Um, well, let me That's ask a you. Really, I'm so impressed that they saw that. That was an Easter egg. That is John Philip Nichols' actual diploma that we got uh, on loan <laughs> to us. So yeah. what a, I'm so glad they caught that. Right. So so uh, l let me ask you just a little question, Chris. Call what it. what did you think of uh, uh, people calling you a conspiracy theorist? Have people called me that? I, I haven't uh, noticed. I mean, you know, I I guess I have. Uh, so I, I prefer the term investigator personally. But, um, you know. Well, I, I guess I, I don't know. Maybe I'm sensitive about it because, you know, that's what uh, I, I started. They started calling me a conspiracy theorist in the in the 70s. And it, it wasn't a 
wasn't a compliment. And, you know, you find these, uh, you want to call them rabbit holes. And, you know, I've been down about every one that I could find. And, you know, one of the first things I, I learned is that a conspiracy theory doesn't have to be true to be effective to make people do things. Okay. Yeah. How, how many false conspiracy theories did you run across? Oh, I, 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 well, I wanted to, I remember a lecture, I watched a lecture that you gave a long time ago. And I remember you, you were talking about conspiracy theories and around the time when you were 19 and you were beginning this process and you start out, you know, looking into the JFK assassination and, uh, and other kind of like conspiracy things. But then before you know it, you're reading kind of uh, sober books about the banking industry, you know, and just, you, you're getting so deep in it. You're just trying to figure out how things work. And, right. and I, I thought I thought that was a really interesting point that you made. You know, you can get outside of the genre of conspiracy theory and, and you you can you can start to see uh, it everywhere. <laughs> right. Especially well, with banking. You know, there's a lot of. Yeah. Yeah. Well, examples. I mean, that's one thing, you know, the people, you know, it, it's kind of. Oh. Uh, to not get people to look here, they'll say, well, there's a conspiracy over there. It's over there. No, it's these people. It's those people. And, you know, it, it, it really, you know, it, it I narrowed it down to uh, intelligence agencies, uh, drug runners, and um, secret societies is, is what I found to be uh, the main players. On the, it. the amazing thing is that the, the JFK assassination was the, or the term conspiracy theorists, conspiracy theorist i think is um it, it was originated or popularized during the jfk assassination which was an actual conspiracy the cia killed the president of the united states and <laughs> well, the, sorry the, the, the CIA. i don't think the cia quite killed him i think this, there were people in the cia involved with him but it okay. wasn't a cia sorry. operation <laughs> you know yeah. Christian, the, the cia sent a memo to many of its offices in 1967 saying rally our assets in the media to disparage these people who are critiquing the war and conclusions as conspiracy theorists that's where that phrase actually got attached as an epithet against people who are looking for the truth the cia wanted to slander folks with that there's a moment in the book uh the devil's chess word sorry to talk about a, a different publishing company where this student at um i think like ucla um confronts um alan dulles at a lecture he's giving at the university and they like go toe toe to toe for he gave dulles the opportunity to meet with him privately while he was in town and he he said if you have something to say to me you can say it in front of the whole place and this kid was so prepared and he just owned alan does i was reading that part of the book i was just like wanted to like jump up and cheer and then he and then alan was like you guys don't want to hear this wish wash this idiot and all the other students were like no no we want to keep talking about it and then alan dulles storms off and then the guy holds like another hour lecture lecturing his fellow students that always learned about all the problems in the warren commission yeah well i really enjoyed the way that you uh told the story in uh your documentary and you kind of get to a, a a false end, and then you go on and show. Well, it you know there is some stuff here. It is it is continuing. And now now Sherry, um, I, I wanted to uh, ask you about if I can remember it here. I just had it in my head. Um, oh, the uh, uh, you were looking into you you had this oh accident with with Queen Elizabeth. Okay. Now, what does that have to do with this story? Well, first, something I want to put out there, isn't it exciting that all of us got to see this visually, finally, to see a documentary where you can see the visuals? I mean, that is something really new. And here... Uh, hear john philip nichols's voice and and hear all these people's exactly. I mean, you you it's talk about your you know your tapes you know but we you know it was cool to hear people nobody uh to my knowledge has put anything out there like this anything like it at all and uh i mean you can write about it you can have it in a book you can have photos but when you see it in a movie 
it's just mind boggling. It's so much more real, you know, so much more exciting. But anyway, I, in, in answer to your question, Chris, um, uh, I was a reporter reporting on drug activity in Mariposa and uh, I ended up in the White House. And I followed it right up into the White House, you know, so what can I say? It was, uh, there was um, drug activity, there was corruption in our Mariposa uh, Sheriff's Department. They were bringing drugs in from Costa Rica. They were distributing them up there in the National Park. There was a park ranger named Paul Berkowitz. And I think, Chris, you published his book later, years later, but he was a park ranger and he went to Congress about the drug activity in Yosemite. And everybody was involved. The LA Times at one point uh, over the murders up there even made a statement that Mariposa was the meth capital of California. OK, because this is a very, very rural area at the base of Yosemite National Park. At that time, when I was there, there was only 3000 people in the town, population of 3000 people. And I was the reporter and the sheriff, a couple of really honest sheriff's deputies. One of them was a guy named Frank McCoy came in as a reporter, wanted me to investigate the drug activity within the sheriff's department, which I did. And I followed it up. Um, there was a man, a commander that um, had been raised in his father was military intelligence and he had been raised as i remember uh in japan in on in military intelligence and he ended up in mariposa as a commander in share at the sheriff's department and um the queen uh was coming up to yosemite and the secret service agents were accompanying her and they were uh, killed. Uh, the commander, that same commander, ran them off the road accidentally and they were killed. And what happened was years later, Ron Williams, who was one of those Secret Service agents, became the head. He was the S Secret Service agent who guarded Reagan. And he ultimately became a private investigator when he retired. But he came to my home and we we did some research on all of that. And it it ended up in the company in Mar in uh, Fresno, the company. And uh, Danny Caslaro was going to talk to Lexington FBI about that uh, the week that he died. And they were en route to visit with Danny. They were going to come to see him in Martinsburg. And they learned he died. I, I actually called the Lexington FBI and they said they learned that he had died and they turned around and went back to Le Lexington. And so that that was two uh, agents that he was going to provide information to on the company, which he learned about from Reconoscuto and uh, Robert Booth Nichols. If and the I company. was an FBI agent, I'm not a cop. If I was an FBI agent and a guy I was going to meet died in a weird way i probably would maybe go to the town instead of just turning around trying to figure something out just saying Doc, yeah you're gonna say something i was just gonna give some con i mean maybe everybody who listens to this or watches this understands what the company is which is but but just as a basis for those who don't which is the, that it's a essentially a drug ring that involved a lot of people who were in both mainly in federal and state and local law enforcement so people who are in a position to uh, know what investigations are happening and subvert those so that they can make a ton of money um, in the drug business, in both Lexington, Kentucky and uh, Fresno, California. Right. Right. The, the company uh, was out of Lexington. The store, the San Francisco Chronicle, written by a very prestigious reporter, Bill Wallace, published on April the 28th in 1982, a story called Spies, Stolen Arms, and Drugs, and it was called The Company. It, it The organization had 300 members, former military men and ex-police officers, and $30 million worth of assets, including planes, ships, and real estate. This was in Fresno, which was 80 miles outside of Mariposa. Imported billions of dollars worth of narcotics from Latin America, involved in gun running and mercenary operations. Danny was investigating that. That was a, you'll see that in his notes. He was on top of that. So he was getting into that with Lexington. There were so many tentacles that he was investigating. And, and uh, you both 
Christian and Zachary, when you came to my home, when you called me and wanted to do an interview, uh, I said, sure, come in. You can see all the documents and tapes and whatnot. You wanted to do a an interview. I said, no. Um, then you c- convinced me to do one minute. And then I agreed to one minute. And then you said, um, well, how about three minutes? I said, okay. And you arrived at my home <laughs> with this film crew and all this really expensive equipment and lighting and, and blocking out all my windows from the outside and so on and so forth. And we ended up doing three eight-hour interviews over a period of three days, which was supposed to start it out, was supposed to be three minutes. And this is, Chris, this is how good these guys are. And you know how hard it is to get an interview with me, right? Oh, absolutely. (laughs) And they were so professional and so good. And they make me feel like a celebrity, right? I I had so much fun being interviewed by Zachary and Christian was out in the garage. It was February. It was freezing. He's out there. With the San garage Diego. Door open. Okay. It's yeah. freezing in San Diego. Yeah. Well, you you come visit me, at Sherry, in New York. You'll find it's quite freezing, yeah. actually. This you were, is actually in, you were in a jacket, though, with the garage door open, standing there with all the lights on in the garage, photographing doc- boxes and boxes of documents. I mean, you guys. Sherry's archive amazing. is legendary. It is the talk it is the stuff of legend her uh bo- her archive of of uh, original uh primary source materials um and she allowed me to uh spend three days copying all of it well and the and the other thing is she said we treated her like a celebrity but for us sherry is a celebrity that's in, true in this, in this world and and she was <laughs> we were just so lucky basically because Christian and I, I mean, I, I I hate to peel back the veil too much on how much of a janky operation we really are running, but you know, we we just flew out to California and went from the northernmost point to the southernmost point, essentially, meeting people along the way with this idea that we had a whole film crew coming out in the next month, and we just had to dig up any interview that we could find of of the people who really were involved with this story on the West Coast. And we had it's a lot easier for us on the East Coast because we could just travel down to D.C. But with the West Coast, it was like we had one shot to to accomplish this. And maybe Sherry just read the desperation in our in our eyes of how much yeah. we talked to her and how how big she loomed in this. Story. No, I will tell you, you should know this because you're going to have future interviews. When you walked in my living room, you knew every name. You knew everything about the octopus story. I call it octopus language. And you spoke it. You knew the book better than I know the book, okay? The Last Circle. And I was so impressed with your knowledge of it. Hey, I could just, we could talk any name and you knew exactly everything there was to know about it. So we could communicate, you know? Mm -hmm. And so that's when I decided to do the interview. I just want to say that's what was really fun for us on the crew. Um, me, me, Me in particular was seeing two kindred spirits, Christian and you, who are separated by you know time and and space but they get together in the same room and they're st- talking the same language it's like you know two long lost twins or something who can finally communicate with somebody because there's so much information there's so many stories that only they really know and they only they're the only people who have genuine true fascination with it and it was just hilarious seeing you guys get together and and just chop it up together about all this stuff Oh, yeah. That, See, this guy just come in and both of you and knew everything, you know, and that, you were that, correcting me. You were correcting me when I would get some of my dates or whatever. You would actually give me information to get it straight. You know, there was one more thing I want to mention. You interviewed people that nobody ever interviewed. I mean, you were going up to doors and tracking people down. I will never know how you found these people. And you know who I'm talking about, Glenn. You know, yeah, yeah, and um, and then you got the interview with uh, um, out at Cabazon and whatnot. These are people that nobody's ever interviewed before, so you've added a lot to the story. No, well, you talk there... about the visuals of uh, of seeing it in a documentary form, and I, and I think the one of the things that we're most proud of is the video deposition that you see of Robert Booth Nichols. And and that transcript had existed on somebody put his transcript of his deposition in 2008 on the internet, but and so we knew what he says on a technical level, 
but it's totally different when you see how he says it and the way his voice is, the who he's looking at in the room. He's obviously so angry to be there and he's staring down his own lawyers um, and, and just being able to absorb what it is like to actually spend time with him. You know, the only people who really know that experience besides, you know, in this story are you and Danny. And, um, and so it's, right. It was cool right. being able to present him and his his the way he carries himself, the way he dresses, the way he looks, uh, to actually see it like you saw it. That interview in chapter twelve of the book uh, brought so many law enforcement people to my doorstep. This was before it was actually published. The word got out that I had interviewed Nichols. I had FBI. I had John Cohen from the judiciary committee calling me i had thomas gates from the fbi and scott lawrence from customs i, I mean it, the list goes on just because i interviewed robert booth nichols you know it was pretty amazing that um they had such an interest in him but you know you got the the voice on there and you also got that film of nichols being depositioned on the, in the samuel israel case yeah and he allegedly died what within two or three months after that correct yeah yeah it's, uh, yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, you know uh, the point you made about being able to talk to each other is something that that really comes home to me because i started looking into this stuff and i would go and there was it took it was about 10 years before i could find somebody that i could talk to about it you know yeah. and and i'm really uh you know really proud of what you guys have done i mean it's it, it's First of all, you you got it aired, okay, and it it's just a, a dynamite a show. Now, I finally remembered, Sherry, what I wanted to ask you about. Besides Queen Elizabeth, was uh, we uh, met I don't know in L.A. a couple of years ago, and one thing you were telling me that there were some people and they were waiting for Ed Meese to die, okay, before they could talk, and Ed Meese is still alive. <laughs> sadly and and you know and it, because you start looking into this stuff and you see well there's a group of people that you know they have access to like you know uh, phone conversations you know they they're they're able to um have all this ac access to to secret information okay and so if you have people running around that have access to the secret information um doing plans i mean they're in a much better position to do that so what was the story about ed meese cool you just opened a pandora's box there chris well um, I, I try yeah well you did it um and i'm sure chris and and um <laughs> zachary are well aware of this too this they because they interviewed thomas gates thomas gates the FBI agent that's in the documentary and um, had called me um, was wiretapping Robert Booth Nichols. And in the wiretap, they, and this is, this is the key to everything as far as I'm concerned. They were wiretapping Robert Booth Nichols, talking to Eugene Giaquinto and people in MCA Corporation. And Qu Qu Giaquinto was, um, would brag about his his relationship with John Gotti, the head of the Gambino crime family. Okay. And in the wiretaps, they captured uh, um, Richard Stabin and Thomas Gates, captured uh, Giaquinto, saying that he would call Edwin Meese and have the FBI's investigation stopped. Now, you have to get the picture of this. You have the FBI and you have uh, Gates and you have Stavin listening on a wiretap to somebody saying that they're going to call the attorney general and have their wiretap shut down. And it was. And it was sealed. Well, after Danny died, Thomas Gates was able to get for the first time in the history of the FBI to get permission to give information to the, the House Judiciary Committee on Inslaw. And they went secretly to John Cohen, who was the investigator for the Inslaw, for the Judiciary Committee, and secretly provided him with copies of those wiretaps. 
And um, so I, just before the book was published in 2009, I contacted both of them via email. And I got it in writing, emails from them, that of what was in those wiretaps. And um, they confirmed what I just said. And so uh, those, that information ultimately was never put in the, the DOJ report on the death of Danny Castellaro or on the Inslaw report. Nothing about those wiretaps. What was in them was ever published publicly. That John means Thorne, shutting down investigations into the mafia. Right. Yeah, yeah the relationship between um, the Department of Justice and MCA Corporation. Howard, was it Howard Baker? Well, I mean, the MCA Corporation, That uh, that uh, what's the name of that talent agent? Be, uh, you're, talking you're, using... about, you're talking about the head of MCA? Or... Yeah, Ronald Reagan's awesome. old talent agent who... Right, right, right. So you're saying to the Department of Justice, but also the, the, the president. Yeah. Uh, Wasserman, well, right. Uh, right. Wasserman. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Lou, Washington, Lou Wasserman. But the one of the members of the board of MCA became Ronald Reagan's um, chief of staff, Howard Baker. And when he left the Reagan administration, he went back to the board of MCA Corporation. So MCA and the Reagan administration were very, very close. And MCA also funded Reagan's campaign. And so um, the fact that Giaquinto was the head of who was on Robert Booth Nichols's corporation was the head of the home entertainment division of MCA Corporation. And he was talking to Edwin Meese from you know M MCA talking to Edwin Meese, but also talking to John Gotti. And it makes such a good to, movie. Whatever was really going on in the like. Okay, sort of we, weird, we got about okay. we got about four minutes because because you guys got to leave here. Yeah. Well, this has been so fun. What yeah. a great conversation. Yeah. We should do this again sometime. Anytime. What's been the response so far? What have you guys heard? A little bit, just yeah. because I feel like we talked about this a bit, but there's a there's a narrative that I'm guilty of kind of pu pushing out there, which is that this is sort of a, a viewpoint into how it feels to go into a, a, a you know, for back of, lack of a better word, a conspiracy theory. And, and it is partly that. I don't retract that. You see the process of Christian and me and Danny and everybody going into this story, but it's Sherry. been interesting to see how people... Yeah, Sherry, of course. It's interesting to see how people um, in, in a certain corner of the media just use that meta narrative about, oh, this is just a story about a conspiracy theory and the dangers of going into a conspiracy theory. And we tried to be very specific in our telling of this story, not to generalize to any other conspiracy theory or whatever. We just wanted to tell this very complicated, very <laughs> broad story. Um on its own terms and try to separate fact from fiction and see where what like you were talking about where the intermingling of fact and fiction actually serves its own purpose which we get into eventually but not generalizing it to uh, you know any other people or any other situation really we're not bringing it up to modern times or anything like that so uh we're not harassing the parents of the sandy hook <laughs> massacre yeah. so it's it's um Interesting to see people use the meta narrative about, oh, it's about a conspiracy theory and what it feels like instead of grappling with the just the specific. Nothing to see here. Nothing to see here. Yeah. Yeah, it's, exactly. Oh, it's it's wild. It's weird. They never get, you know, into no. really what happened. It's like, no, we get into a lot of what happened. Just and we document it really well. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. Have to stick up for ourselves a little bit in, in, in that respect. I just wish people would actually look at the, the things we got rather than the shiny fun colors they're seeing on the screen well well again, you got it all yeah it, it, it's a great show it's called american conspiracy the octopus murders on netflix and sherry C based a lot on sherry seymour's book the last circle uh danny castellaro investigation into the octopus and the ins law and there's so much more that we could have talked about you know oh, i wanted to can i leave can i leave with the with the epigraph from the sure. last circle sure but if my words be seed that may bear fruit of infamy to the traitor whom I gnaw. Amen. Onwards to a better future. Amen. Thank you, Chris.